This is actually not going to be one work, but it's a series of work with a, a bunch of people. Uh, Ernesto De Vito, um, Luigi Caratino, Alessandro Rudi, Silvia Villa, and a bunch of others. So um, I'll jump right, right in with a bunch of notations, but hopefully it will be simple enough. And uh, the first part is going to be just some motivation and some uh, general reasoning. I'm going to describe this kind of problem. So very, very simple uh, statistical learning problem, or you might want to call it regression, linear least squares of regression, in fact. So given a pair of random variable, input and output, you want to find some function that relates them, and you stick to linear models. You'll see in a minute why I want to do that. And so the goal is to actually find something that minimizes some uh, expectation that you might not be able to uh, have access to or might be too expensive just through a, a bunch of samples that are IID. Okay, so very, very basic. So this is the problem we care about. And you know, th this is, you know, like uh, bio next two slides are biography, okay? I start this way, try to figure out what the hell this means. Okay, this is what you have today. This is what you have tomorrow. Then what you do with it. And you say, okay, I can do some kind of statistics because what happens is that you don't have access to the true expectation, but you have access to the data. So you might want to try minimize the error on your data. But then typically it's not a good idea for a bunch of reasons. And so you might want to add some constraint. Okay, you can view it from probabilistic terms as a maximum posteriori given a probabilistic prior. You can view it from a constraint optimization point of view. You can view it from a regularization point of view. You can view this as a stabilizer or as a selection criterion of one of many solutions. You name it, okay? You pick the one that you have already in your brain, stick to it, doesn't matter. And then you can put your statistician hat and try to prove if this is a good idea or not. After all, you try to solve a problem that you cannot solve exactly because you don't have access to it. So you might want to know how much uh, precision, how much accuracy you can hope for given these many data points, okay? And then you can do theorems that look like this, okay? You put some minimal condition on, uh, on uh, your, your uh, random variables, and then you choose the regulation parameter in such a way that you achieve some kind of error, okay? So a caveat here, I'm going to assume throughout that even though this is a linear model, it can be infinite dimensional, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a bit more why I do this in a minute. Um, but so this is the kind of classical non-parametric rates you get. Uh, we're not going to be dealing with constants, but just more with rates. And this is a worst case rate, which turns out to be good enough. You basically, if, unless you make further assumption, you cannot really improve on this, okay? Um, all right, so uh, I mean, this is uh, in this infinite dimensional uh, uh, setting is what you can settle for. And of course here, this is just, uh, uh, you know, typical the game here is what about other loss functions? What about a regularizer? What about other function classes, okay? And if you, you know, if you open uh, the last 20 years of machine learning theory, you find tons and tons of paper that do just that, okay? Smooth, non-smooth, uh, convex, non-convex, multi-layer, non-multi-layer, and so on and so forth. And of course, then you can be obsessed with rates. You can make it faster, faster, can I go faster, okay? Then uh, you can play the next game, which is uh, you, uh, you talk to the other side of your brain where like you hate statistics, but well, after all, this is a new problem. It's uh, an optimization problem. God knows where it come from, but it's just a minimization problem. So I can just study as an optimization problem as such. And you can come up with something like this. The simplest idea is the one before is the simplest idea. So you just do something like uh, gradient descent, okay? And then you can go and prove something. In this case, this is a nice problem. I stick now to the square law, to the square norm, just you know, just for the sake of the argument. You find some good rates. This is again, imagine this is something you're more or less you're familiar with. And then you can again play the same game. Oh, what about a loss function? What about a regularizer? What about L solvers? After all, this is just gradient descent. But can you do something like conjugate gradient descent, incremental gradient descent, uh, Newton method, uh, you name it. Okay. And then again, what about faster rates? Can you do faster? Fast going fast seems to be generally very important, whichever is the question you, you're trying to solve, okay? And you know, I'm, this is biographic in the sense that this is what I've been doing and I've still been doing it in a minute for the last uh, 15 years in the, of my life since I started doing this stuff. And you go in real life and you, it's a reality check and you say, well, this stuff just doesn't exist almost anymore. People are just putting together, okay, this is a deep network, but it doesn't really matter. What this stands for is a bunch of tricks and you know, bunch of choices that implements the stuff I showed you before, okay? Many, many, many tricks. You do averaging, you do mini batching, you do acceleration, you do projection, you do sketching, you start to compose, okay? And then you can go on Twitter, which is now the source of all knowledge, and ask Ben, who's after all our own favorite oracle, who here gives you the final truth. Anything you do, you can call it regularization, okay? Any tricks you do. 
And now you can take, uh, uh, you know, you can be relieved because you're like, oh, right, so, you know, anything I do, I can just call it regularization. Regularization, I heard, is the way to think about things, so now I'm game, okay? Then if you're me, you gotta be frustrated, so you're like, okay, can I make any more sense about uh, what the oracle says? For example, um, let's make a more uh, reasonable list, okay? Let's list a bunch of things, okay? For example, I see plot all the time that show you accuracy on the one hand, and then training time on the other hand. And then say, oh, you don't have overfitting. Oh, you have overfitting. Why does it make sense even to talk about overfitting with respect to training time? Is there any sense with which training time is a good measure of complexity, okay? And that's just the beginning, okay? Because then you can say, what if I accelerate? When I do stochastic gradients, step size, mini batch, average, sketch, and sample preconditioning, okay? It's just my own list if the one before was Ben's list, okay? And what I'm gonna try to show you today is a list that in some sense, actually all of these are really regularization, okay? In a precise sense and can be quantified, okay? At least in this naive least square setting I show you, which by no means is, you know, what you should you know, we'll be working on if you want to just uh, win whatever challenge, but it's a simple enough playground to get the feeling, and the idea is that many of these ideas will carry on to much more complicated settings. Of course, A, you know, I might not be able to prove things at all, or you might have to sweat much more than I did, okay? So this is more or less, uh, you know, the, where, where the, score, the story is gonna go. Prove Ben's right. All right, so the first, uh, the first trick is gonna be just looking at a very simple thing, which is just look at least squares error and uh, do gradient descent on it, okay? So you take this, if you want to write it in a matrix form just because it's a bit more compact, and you just do gradient descent, vanilla gradient descent, okay? Nothing else, that's all you do. Is this a learning algorithm in some sense? Is it a solver or a statistical procedure? How you wanna think about that? Well. First of all, you can ask, uh, uh, has anybody thought about this? Yes, of course, there's nothing new here. And actually, you find out that you can call this in many different names. You can pick the one you want. I guess if you're a human being, you might wanna call it gradient descent learning. But if you wanna be fancy, you probably wanna call it L2 boosting. But it's that, okay? It's just that. Uh, here you're using uh, the full uh, matrix uh, of X and the full Yeah, it's a batch gradient. It's like a vanilla batch gradient, okay? All right. So. This stuff here, you know, we, we could motivate this from, from what you met it before. I imagine most of you have met something like this before. But this thing here, you, one usually think of it as a solver, as an optimization device, not as a statistical device. But is it, can it be used as a statistical device, okay? Can it be used to what? To fit the data in a way that where you control how well you fit or not? And this turns out to be the case indeed. So. Uh, consider just a simple case again for the sake, imagine that here rather than just a linear model, you allow yourself a combination of something like sine and cosine, okay? So just a, a particular case of linear model on some finite number of features. Then what you could do is to try to fit this kind of data and you let this iteration go and you know, it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. And then at some point it starts to do what it's supposed to, which is fitting the data, okay? So now you can say, okay, so iterations, so this is a descent method. At every step, you fit a bit more, I fit a bit more. As if you start from something simple, you're gonna get a solution which is more and more complicated. So it feels like the number of iteration, which is the training time really, is doing some kind of controlling the complexity of your solution, okay? It's not that important actually here whether you overfit or not overfit. Of course, that's important. But even more important is the idea that through the steps you take in your optimization, you go from simple to complicated, okay? which is kind of how you think about building learning algorithm anyway, fit the data in a controllable and controlled way. So if you are a practitioner, you can be convinced enough perhaps and go try and see if indeed you can do. But again, we've seen this before. You could just put training time and you see what's happening, okay? Can we make any sense of this? And it turns out that even just some back of develop compilation give the feeling that this is actually a sensible idea. So this is pretty much the only bunch of computation I'm gonna show you today. Just, if you just reshuffle the order of the, of the computation in the gradient descent and you write it this way, it's a one line induction argument to prove that you can write it like this, okay? It's really just one line induction proof. Now if you look at it like this, now you can start to recognize that that looks a bit like a geometric series for matrices, okay? In fact, if you let t goes to infinity, you get just this, okay? So I only replaced finite t with infinity, 
And then this becomes a geometric series. And if this series converge, which now you see that is gonna give you some information how to choose the step size, then you get the inverse, okay? I just called sigma hat this inverse that defines the square problem. All right, so the number of iterations as it goes on is gonna give me an approximate inverse. Even more so, you can now play the same game and just instead of looking at the, the all the way down, just do the residual of this and write it explicitly, okay? You can do that and basically what you see is that you get an expression like this. And if you see that if you take t equal to one in this expression, you get something which is essentially proportional to this x trans, sorry, this should be an x, to this x transpose y, okay? If you compare this to the classical ridge regression or least squares, which is when you take the inverse and you add something on the diagonal, you guess you'll get something very similar, okay? If lambda is very large, this term is not gonna matter and you just find something which is proportional to this, okay? So this gives you a feeling that the number of iterations is really playing a role similar to this ridge regression parameter when you penalize in this least square setting. If, if T is very large, you're essentially inverting a matrix, pretty much like what you're doing when lambda is very small. And if T is very big, you're doing pretty much what you're doing uh, when lambda is very big, okay? So it seems like T and lambda are going opposite to each other. So I always like to show this because it's simple. It's very simple. After all, it just uh, recognizes something. I haven't done it, so I can you know, brag about it as much as I want. And it gives you really a, a nice, uh, you know, a nice view on uh, something which is kind of a magic fact. Training time is the same as adding a penalty, okay? It's completely obvious from this, but the first time I saw this, I was like, oh, well, I never thought about that, okay? Of course, this is a very specific argument. It holds for least squares. Everything it's written here holds for least squares, okay? And if you want to try to generalize this for other stuff, other penalties, other uh, whatever, okay? You have to work hard, okay? And I know the answer in some cases and we can discuss it offline, but at least it gives you a clear feeling that there is something going on, okay? That there is some kind of interplay between optimization and statistics in a deep sense. So far so good? Now, this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is an argument, but it's actually not proof, okay? It just show an analogy between this way of computing things and this way of computing things from a statistical point of view. But can you quantify this? And it turns out that indeed you can, okay? If you make the standard assumption that a minimizer exists, I stick to that, although, you know, it's debatable, you can make it stronger or weaker, then you basically find out that you do get some kind of rates and the number of iteration is basically playing the reverse role of the regularization parameter, okay? It's a one over lambda if you want. Perhaps more interesting is the way you prove this because you split the error in two parts and now you can think about these two parts in different way. You can think of this as a bias invariance if you want, because it is. But the bias is the optimization part, okay? It is. So they, there is no new term, there is no tr new trade-off. It's an old trade-off in, in a new way, okay? So there is a complete collapse between statistics and optimization. Okay. <coughs> All right, so uh, it's exactly the same about the stick and it's as good as before. So now you, you, know, you start to say, okay, I have two ways to do exactly the same thing I, with this exactly the same assumption. Should I do one or the other? Well, the only difference is in the amount of computation you need to do. If you do a computation like this, you're crazy. But if you do the computation the right way, which is this way, you just get quadratic cost per iteration, okay? Up to the number of iteration that uh, you have to pick. Whereas if you do things like this, typically you get cubic computations, okay? So you have the same, again, everything here is worst case. If this one gets better, that one gets better too, okay? But in the worst case, you get something like essentially quadratic versus something which is cubic. And even worse, if you have to solve this problem for many lambdas, which is usually you do, because when you do cross-validation or anything you wanna do, you typically have to solve this problem for multiple lambdas, okay? So what you have is two way of doing things that from a statistical point of view are essentially indistinguishable, but from a computational point of view, they start to be different. And the gain was basically taking a statistical point of view on optimization, if you want. You take an algorithm that is an optimization algorithm, but you now view it as a statistical procedure. Okay. 
All right, now if you take that point of view, now you say, okay, this is line one of the optimization book. What about line two and three and four and six? Because after all, now you can just go in and say, okay, what's next? Well, for example, you can so and say, oh, what about conjugate gradient? What about Chabichev method? What about Nesterov acceleration? Can I use this, okay? And here I put not the people that invented it, but the people that asked this question in the context of statistical learning, okay? And here I just write to you the phase of Nestor acceleration in this very simple setting, which is basically the idea that it's very similar to gradient descent, but uh, in every iteration, rather than using the previous iteration, you use a convex combination of the previous two combinations, okay? That's the basic idea. And you use, this is just one possible choice of the weighting between these two parameters. The basic idea of this is that it has the same iteration cost as GD, but it converges much faster, okay? Typically, gradient descent converges one over t. This is uh, the typical idea, and this task actually converges one over t squared, okay? And then again, you see, you're happy, you converge faster. But you converge fast where? You go super fast where? Where are you going that fast? You're fitting the data extremely fast. Is that a good idea? Why would you want to have an algorithm that overfit or tries to overfit as fast as possible? Unclear, right? If you're applying this idea to the regularized problem, where you already took care of stabilizing everything, eh, then it would be fine. But here, there's nothing. So why do you want to go that fast? Is this useful or not? At least it's a decent question, okay? It's not an obvious question. It's slightly new, okay? Turns out that actually is you can, if you now take the point of view I showed you before, so you remember that your goal is to minimize the test error, the future error, you get a slightly different answer. First of all, what you see is that, well, let me jump to, again, the proof. Indeed, you have the, in the decomposition of there, you have this one over T square popping out, okay? Which is the whole reason to go on. But then when you look at the variance term, you actually have another T square popping out there too, okay? So this is a little bit full wisdom, but depending who you ask, most people are not really aware of it. Acceleration methods are known to be less stable, okay? They are, they really are in the sense that the variance term in a statistical sense explodes much faster. As they fit faster, they explode faster. So if you use an accelerated method, you're not gonna get a better error overall. You don't get a better solution in general, okay? What do you get is that you can, you know, if there is a stopping time, you can stop earlier. Before I add the square root of n here, and now we can n to the one fourth, okay? So this is the basic idea. If you look at the training error, you're gonna see that GD goes down and accelerated GD goes also down. If you look at the test error, what you see is that they're gonna go down and potentially up, and we're gonna comment in this in a second, and AGD does whatever GD is doing earlier, okay? So it doesn't go lower, it just does it earlier, okay? Now, j just because there was a lot of discussion in the last year or so about these kind of plots, uh, do you see this on all data sets? No, you don't, okay? This is the situation where you have a model which is powerful enough, okay? And you have a bunch of data that are not so many and noisy enough. There are a bunch of situations where your data are a lot and not so noisy. Your model is so dumb that there's really no sense in the regularizing. You should just fit, fit the hell out of it. And you don't have time to do it, you know, because as much as you run, if you have 10 million points, you're not gonna go any close to convergence to the training error. And then your plot typically looks like this, okay? It's gonna look like that. So typically what you see is that you're far away from any region where you can somewhat get close to fit well, uh, not your training, that you can do, you can just overfit, but you know, your test set, because in some sense your model is too poor for that. And so what you have is that what, in that case, it's really that you, you, you never wanna stop, you just wanna go as fast as possible, as far as possible, okay? But this still gives you a feeling what's going on below this, okay? This is the general principles that govern the, the whole thing. All right, so then you can start, you know, you keep on playing this game, you're gonna play it a little bit more, but not too long. For example, you can say, what about stochastic gradients, okay? Can I do stochastic gradients? And now if you see the literature of stochastic gradients, it's funny because as an optimizer, you take the data, you try to optimize the error on your data or some penalized version, and you pass over the data a lot of time, okay? That's the typical thing you do. Then you play the statistician game and you only pass over the data once, you know, one pass. Then people do one thing in practice, then theory tells you another thing. Can we study both things at the same time? Okay, so here I write this, you see I'm annoying you with a slightly heavier notation with IT, which means essentially that I allow myself every time I take a point to pick it in some 
uh, predefined way. So IT here is a strategy in which I pick point. The simplest one is a um, cyclic strategy. So my points are sitting on my disk and I just visit them one at a time in a prescribed order, okay? Another thing could be I, I visit them, them, all of them every time, but I reshuffle them every time I pass through, okay? Or I can just pick them uniformly at random, which is what I'm gonna show you today, which is basically the SGD or uh, stochastic gradient descent or rather method approach, okay? So IT is gonna be this choice and for the next few slides, I'm gonna assume that it's done uniformly at random. And uh, see here, if I do N steps, it means that I'm effectively looking at the data once. If I allow myself to um, sample uniformly at random with replacement, it means that I might see a data points twice, okay? But on average, I see each guy once after I do N point, N pass. So T equal N is one pass. The main difference with respect to before, which is what Quentin was asking before, here at every step, you just look at one point, not at all the data points, okay? So you have to take N steps before you have seen all the data. All right, so can we analyze this uh, as before? And again, it turns out that yes, you can. And basically what you see is that if the number of iteration was the key parameter before, now, uh, now is the product of the number of iteration times the steps you take. And here I'm assuming that this algorithm is done with the fixed step size, not the decaying sequence. It's also possible to do the other one. It just gets a bit heavier. So if you want, this says essentially that the amount of distance you know, the algorithm is making, you know, is, is basically the amount of, uh, the number of steps times the length of the step is the regularization parameter. How far you go plays the role of regularization parameter. If you don't go very far, you're keeping it simple. If you go very far away, you're keeping it complicated. And so any choice of this distance, which is order of square root of n, is good enough to give you the rate. Particularly, what you see that you can, the one that makes sense in this case is to take t equal n and gamma equal one over square root of n, okay, which is the classical one. And then you get back the usual rate. If you look at the bounds, the bounds look slightly more complicated, but essentially you see that this quantity one over gamma t controls both the bias and the variance of your algorithm, okay? <coughs> Let me say here, because uh, uh, it's a good point, uh, in all I show you today, my main goal is, again, is to showcase different ideas in a unifying framework, showing you the effect of all these ideas from the statistical point of view. And so that's why I keep this super simple setting. Particularly, I'm only assuming the minimizer to exist, and I don't say anything else, okay? There are at least two in more interesting situations I'm not gonna discuss. The one where you know something more, or the one where you know something less, okay? For example, you might say, I know that this guy lies in a subspace of my, of my uh, possible solution. Can I do something better than that? Yes, you can, okay? Depending on the subspace, you can have to use some kind of techniques or others, okay? If it's a subspace or they have vectors of the principal component, it's very natural to basically get the same result. On the other hand, you can say, okay, the truth is that I don't have a minimizer, okay? If you're in an infinite dimensional case in a non-parametric setting, it's not always true that you can always project and find the best possible approximate. But you can ask yourself how far you are. So you basically have something that is out, you have a subspace, you try to project in that subspace, it's outside, but you can ask yourself how far you are, okay? So that's a bit more complicated to explain, but intuitively it's clear. You have a space, you can be inside, you can be right there, or you can be outside. And depending how you modulate this, you can go into simpler and harder problems. Okay, does it make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the, the constant here depends on W star. So even in this case, the constant here, I'm, I'm just writing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, I'm playing only with rate here, but what is asking if I can at least get the dependence on W star, yes, and it basically wouldn't be essentially, I think in this case it may be quadratic to, to W star, okay? Uh, the constants here depend essentially on the bounds on the random variables and, uh, and that. These are the main invariants that appear in the constants. If you allow me we'll, to at least discuss what happens when you go to these either more complicated or easier problems, what you see that whenever you see a square root of n is actually gonna become a more complicated power of something that basically says how complicated or easy is the problem, okay? So whenever you see a square root of n here, you're gonna see n to the alpha, beta, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this whole picture becomes a bit more blurred and you really see that this, you have really multiple regime and we can use, you can choose the step size of the regulation parameter or you can choose the uh, number of passes of the regulation parameter or both, okay? So you can use, for example, you do a couple of trials where you just try to fix a reason. It's when, you know, when you lose a Gaussian kernel and you fix the width 
and, and the resolution parameter. You have two parameters playing the same game. You can choose how you use them. You can just do a quick tuning. The, the tuning of the resolution parameter, the step size is annoying if you do it in a serial way because you have to try one and then the other. So you might just try to get it not too wrong and then let the number of passes do the rest of the job because in a serial architecture is very natural. If you can run things in parallel, you might as well you know, do a bunch of things. Okay, so this is basically what's going on. And then one thing that uh, we asked was, okay, what about mini batching, okay? Oftentimes what you see in practice is that you actually don't do something like this simple, but what you do is that you do something in between a full batch, the one I showed you before, and this guy. So for example, you can say, I'm gonna take B points, compute the gradients on those B points, sum them up, and then use them, okay? Which, you know, it's gonna go something like this, a, a little ugly, but the main point here is that here, this gradient is now looking at not at one, not at all, and looking at B point, okay? And you can ask, okay, what is this doing? Keep in mind that now you have to be aware what does it mean to do one pass over the data, and obviously one pass is gonna be re related to B, okay? Basically, N over B is gonna be one effective pass over the data. So in this case, what you can show is, again, you get, uh, uh, Something similar to before, so let the, let's look quickly and then forget about how you get these results, which is again, is a bound similar to the one I showed you before, but I factor in explicitly the dependence on this B parameter. And then I can consider different regimes, okay? Again, on the test error. So for example, I can consider the, I can go back to the one I showed you a second ago, B equal to one. And then I get the one of square root of N, the T equal N. Or I can take B equal square root of N Okay, and what you see now is that you can actually take a constant step size and you can uh, just uh, run the whole thing for square root of n iterations, which means one pass over the data in this new way of counting, okay? Interestingly, at least in this basic scenario, if you actually take larger step sizes, you don't get anything at all, okay? So there is a, a, a whole set of batch sizes that go from square root of n all the way to n, or you don't gain, okay? You don't gain in the sense that for all this stuff, statistically is the same, but actually it looks like you have to just do more iterations or more computations for no gain, okay? You just increase, you enter in a stupid regime. You just increase computation without gaining anything at all, okay? Um, just because this is uh, pretty clear how, and it was also true before, this here is, optimal in, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, simplified setting, or th that's what we're shooting for. If you ask me if any of this is optimal, I don't know, okay? If you ask me, oh, but are you sure that this is the best thing, can you make it even lower? I don't know, okay? These are a computational complexity question, and I don't know about that. I know that this is, at least is true, okay? That, you know, if you go in between, it's gonna be, uh, you don't gain anything. But of course you can, if you ask me of any of this border, of any of this, you know, the boundaries of these choices, I don't know. And it's not a statistical question anymore, it's an algorithmic uh, complexity question. All right, so quickly, um, one thing that you can do is averaging, okay? The simplest way is do uniform averaging. And I'm gonna discuss this too much, but essentially this, the bottom line is by doing this, you can get slightly bigger step sizes, okay? You can take in this kind of setting, instead of the one of square root of n, you can take something bigger, okay? Or, and the, you know, th this is work that uh, Francis Bach and his co-author, uh, Emeric Dioleve, Nicolas Flammarion, Eric Moulin, and others has been doing the last few years. This is actually, it, 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 it's, it's cool. And uh, on the other hand, to me, ask the question, is this again some form of regularization? Can I view it as something to control the stability? Intuitively it's clear, if you look at the original motivation by Poliak and others to do this kind of averaging, it was to stabilize things. But then typically what you see is you only see this as the after effect. You just see that you get a bigger step size. So in some sense you imagine it as something more oscillating, you smooth it in, but then you can take bigger step size. But it's not quite apparent from the analysis that this is the case. So very recently with Gergay uh, Noy, we actually consider a slightly different uh, um, averaging that we call geometric averaging. And uh, this, is a, this is a simple idea, but it's the first step in one direction. And we consider this because it, feel, it'll, uh, it'll, uh, it somewhat highlights that indeed averaging can be seen as a form of regularization in a precise sense. So we consider the following average. We call it geometric averaging because I said from the equation, essentially the idea is the following. You're gonna take weights for your uh, iterates and the weights are gonna be big at the beginning and then become smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? And they do that with the geometric rates. And uh, uh, there is a parameter lambda that govern 
the geometric decay, okay? And then you just do the, you know, normalize the weights and you, and you do your averaging. So the interesting thing is that it's actually not too hard to prove that this thing here is essentially the same in expectation to doing just a ridge regression, okay? So if you do this form of geometric averaging or you penalize in the limit, it's gonna be the same thing. It's equivalent, okay? Isn't it, I, I, I hear the rescaling factor is just something that depends on gamma, okay? That's all. So in some sense, this shows, and again, this is more a spotlight than any explanation. It shows that in this case, indeed, that you have, uh, um, you can interpret the geometric uh, averaging as a form of regularization in a precise sense. And then you can get bounds like the one I show you here, okay? I'm not gonna show you now because it's really not so important. And of course, also this is just, again, the beginning of a story because what about other kind of averaging? For example, this is taking a decaying sequence that weights a lot at the beginning and very little at the end, but what about the other one? Or what about whatever you wanna take? What if I take any function that it makes sense, it's easy to compute here? How does it impact the behavior of the algorithm, okay? At least in principle, this should give away, this kind of reason should give away to evaluate the effect of averaging more generally, okay? Okay, look, so going to the end, so far we take the data and we process them in some order, either all together or um, one at a time, but we basically always kept the data uh, in their uh, original form, okay? So far the basic, uh, from a high level, the basic idea uh, we consider is marrying statistics with optimization or really convex optimization, okay? And all the tricks we found there. Acceleration, stochastic gradients, using mini batches, using uh, uh, averaging, okay? In practice, when you have a large data set, oftentimes you try to find tricks to reduce the dimension of the data set, okay? You just, uh, it's too big, it doesn't fit memory, okay? And so what you try to do is to reduce its size. And there are a couple of different ways of doing it, which are very much related. The first thing is sketching, okay? Sketching is basically just taking a vector and multiplying by a sequence of vectors, okay? And the simplest case that we're gonna consider is the one where these samples, these vectors are IID and isotropic, in the sense that if you take the covariance, it's just the identity. One way to understand this kind of approximation is that if you take the inner product, so I'm gonna call x tilde here, this projected data. If m is much smaller than the original dimension, of course you gain a lot of uh, computation, okay? One way to understand this is to say, to notice that if you actually take, sorry, there is a normalizing factor missing here, but essentially that if you take the inner product with these finitely many uh, projections, and if you let the number of projections go to infinity, in the limit, you go back to the original data. Okay, so you can view this as, a, sorry, there are a couple of typos here. There's one over M and a parenthesis missing there. So in some sense, there is a, um, asymptotically, you, in a, there is a precise sense in which it is an approximation of the original problem, okay? And then you can be fancier, you can consider different kind of sketching, possibly nonlinear, and essentially uh, this stuff, you can view it as a, uh, very related to considering uh, neural networks with one hidden layer, and where rather than optimizing everything, you pick the intermediate layer, the hidden layer, as random weights, okay? And it's basically the idea of uh, uh, um, Rahimi and Recht uh, to use random features, okay? But just think of this for this talk is gonna be uh, enough. The question you can ask is, okay, I making an approximation, I gotta go back to the original, I, is it computation, it's clearly a computational trick, okay? Does it have a role from a statistical point of view? Is it a form of regularization of some kind? Is, is there an interplay with regularization? And especially you can say, by picking M small, I'm gonna make the problem much faster to solve when it's much smaller memory footprint. But what is the price you pay from a statistical point of view, okay? It's pretty clear that you should pay a price, but actually you don't. What you can see, so you, you can, uh, you can um, I, I wrote here you know, the face of the algorithm if you do ridge regression or you do the stochastic gradient method I showed you before. I'm gonna show you the results for the stochastic gradient method. It looks all the same as before, so you, don't, you just have to stare at the fact that there is you know, just a one over M popping out there. And then it's exactly the same condition as before, and then you just add one extra condition, which is that M has to be equal to one over square root of N, okay? So what you see is that if the number of features, it's order, sorry, not one over, just square root of n, okay? That would be too nice to be true. <laughs> if it's order square root of n, then you don't lose uh, anything at all, okay? At least uh, in expectation and in fact with high probability. 
So interestingly, it seems that in some sense, square root of n is the, in some sense, the, the right dimension of the problem. If your parameters capture this right dimension, and it's a, it can be made precise, essentially a statistical dimension of your problem, then you are enough taking this uh, amount of memory and time, okay? Your resources scale with that. And that's why it's important to remember that if you take a problem which is simpler or harder, this is gonna change. This root of n is gonna become something else because the statistical dimension of your problem does change. <coughs> if you want another way to think about it is, even though your data are high dimensional and many, you know that you're gonna regularize and you're regularizing mean essentially throwing away information. This is a way to do it before rather than later. Rather than get everything, compute and throw away, you get less and compute less, okay? And essentially uh, the results show that that's possible. Yeah. And yeah. Get something like m over n. Yeah. So in this case, if you so suppose that I'm doing everything for p equal to infinity, what happens if you do p equal uh, p? Okay, whatever, which is not infinity. Here you will get instead of one over square root of n, you get p over n. Okay, and here you get something that essentially depends on uh, uh, p. Okay. So p is m times n. M would be yes. Okay. So essentially, you have to look at the data. Okay, that's that's the basic idea. If your data are low rank, instead of P, you can put here the rank of your data, okay? So in some sense, it's the, the effective dimension of your data set, okay? And it's over one over square root of n. Yeah. Which so is kind of linked to that as well. Say it again? If you, if you put n is equal to square root n, uh, your m over n becomes one over square root of n. Right? So the, what you should think about is this stuff is all for the case where P is equal to infinity. If your P is finite, you get here P, and here you will get uh, P over N, okay? And all this bound changes a bit because whenever you see this N, you will get some dimension popping up. So it's slightly different. <coughs> okay. Uh, so how interesting and surprising is this with respect to what we know? So this is relative recent results. So we proved these results for the ridge regression estimator first last year. Now we generalize it for stochastic gradients. And to the best of my knowledge, these are the first two cases where we can prove that you can get this kind of rates with the number around the feature which is smaller than square root of n. Sorry, smaller than n, okay? Previous results that are basically the original results by Rahimi and Recht and by Buck showed that you just take a naive sketching, okay? You need O of n random features or sketching to achieve this kind of bounds, which is too big and bigger than what you observe in practice. Um, I should say that uh, Francis uh, Bach showed that you can actually, if you do some kind of adaptive sampling, you can get even better, okay? But he only used it to prove that you can go um, from O of n to square root of n. What we showed that in fact, in this setting, you can do much better. If you know something about, say, the dimension of your data, you can make it much smaller, okay? You can take much more. For example, if you take a Gaussian kernel or something like, uh, say, function that have a very uh, limited capacity, not very complex, then essentially you can put a constant here, okay? That's the basic idea. And in the case of finite dimension, you can put exactly the dimension there. Um, all right. L let me finish uh, with uh, one, uh, um, one last, uh, uh, one last idea. So I don't wanna talk about it, but essentially everything I said can be neuralized if rather than do sketching, you do subsampling, which means that basically that you take just a subset of points and you write your vectors that you're looking for as a, sorry, there is a mi high missing here. There is a linear combination of the subsample points. So you don't throw away data. You keep all the data, but you use only a subset of them to write down the vectors you're looking for, okay? So you simplify the class of function, but you still use all the data. This is interesting for two reasons. One reason is that it is uh, uh, basically what is called Nystrom methods, but more importantly, it's uh, very much related to what is called Galerkin methods in, uh, numerics and anal in numerical analysis and PDEs. It's the, essentially the same thing. In fact, if you look at the literature here, you basically can find similar results and similar, um, so related approaches and uh, uh, use technical tools. The interesting thing here, typically everything is deterministic. The point here is that typically we're gonna choose this point at random in the simplest ways is uniformly at random. Um, to look at this kind of stuff, it's usual to take uh, a linear algebra point of view because it turns out that if we were looking at the conflict optimization book before, now we switch to linear algebra and particularly to a recent trend in linear algebra called randomized linear algebra, okay? Essentially, the idea here is that if you massage a bit the problem in the classical case of ridge regression, what you see is that 
uh, through this technique, you pass from solving a big linear system, which is basically uh, a square matrix, positive, positive, positive definite asymmetric, to essentially selecting a bunch of columns, okay, and just working on a much smaller matrix. So rather than working with the big problems, now you just work with the slice of the problem. <coughs> Typically, in the literature there, how, what you see is that you want, the idea is that you want to solve this problem exactly, okay, that's really what you want to solve. Here, the idea is this is not what I want to solve. This is what I have today, the training data. What I want to solve is the future. And so I have hope. That's why I have hope that even chopping off a large chunk of this problem, I can still lose no accuracy, okay? And that's exactly what you can prove. So this is yet another way to think of what I showed you before. We can do this. So let, me, let me just finish with uh, a couple of uh, 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 results. Huh? So the last trick I haven't talked about is preconditioning, okay? And so I have no time to 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 any details here. I just want to show you some plots. But I just want to show you that this whole story for us was not was on the one end. Let's try to understand algorithmic tricks. But also, so let's see if you know how we can combine them in a good way to get something better what was there before. And we did it in this simple setting. And the most obvious application of what I show you here is essentially kernel methods when you have to scale them up. Okay, so this is what I want to show you now. The last trick that made the difference to us was using preconditioning, which roughly speaking is given a linear system, pre-multiply the linear system by something that makes the condition number better, the ratio between the biggest and the smallest eigenvalue. The problem is that typically this computation is very hard to make. So our idea was, let me show it in picture. Okay, this is what I would like to do. I know that chopping off this thing up to this way, I don't lose much. To compute the preconditioning alone, I'm actually further chopping this up, and I'm just going to look at you know, the top left corner of this. Okay? So I'm going to solve this problem with the precondition computed on a smaller matrix. So I do projection twice. I project the linear system once, I keep it, and then I project it again just to compute the preconditioning. Okay? Then we combine everything together. I'm going a bit fast, but I'm happy to discuss offline. So essentially, we write down an algorithm that is going to be a gradient method with, pre with projection and precondition. So we use three tricks, optimization, sketching, twice, to compute the preconditioning and this thing, OK? We call it Falcon for absolutely no reason. We can prove a bunch of stuff, uh, but let me show you some tables, OK? Which are a bit less lame than my usual table. My usual table are, I tried this. I want to be sure that it didn't explode. I do this. If I do data selection enough, it works well, OK? This one actually worked a bit better than usual. And essentially, what we did is that we tried to find all the data sets we could find around that have more than a million points and where data feature engineering is not the main thing, okay? If you take, say, images or audio, the big deal is just feature engineering. If you take other data sets, that's not really the main point. And here is a few, okay? Million song, Yelp, and so on. TMIT is actually no audio data sets, but we use pre-extracted feature from there. And what you see here is a bunch of competitors. Some of them are using a kernel methods. Some of them are, are boosted trees. Some of them are deep neural networks. And the bottom line of this whole bunch of numbers is, if you look at the accuracy, and we have a couple of days we are measuring it, we don't do much better or worse than anybody else. It's basically we're all there. If you look at time, we do a lot better with everybody else, like 55 seconds, 20 minutes, 1.5 hours, especially because this is run on a single machine with a single GPU whereas all of these are typically run on clusters of machines, okay? So the speed up is crazy dramatic, but even more important, it, it goes back to having a, a, you know, a trial and error phase that is in the time of sitting in front of a computer, clicking, see what's going on, get it back, and maybe at some point run for a week, okay? You can do things with a cycle which is um, you know, at the level of my patients. We ended up looking at, uh, at uh, physics data, okay, which are the biggest data sets currently available, and the, the trend is the same. We finished up looking at the images just because we wanted to have an idea, and here we cheat, okay? We are not trying to beat neural networks. I don't believe this is possible uh, for this kind of data. So what we did is that we used neural networks, what I know they're really useful for, which is uh, building good features, and then we chop off the first fully connected layers and replace them with our algorithm. We don't do any back propagation and see what happens. And what happens is that it works, okay? So whenever you don't have the time to recompute your features or do a, a fine tuning of your features, this actually works pretty well. And I don't have, I have some further results I can show you that somewhat confirm this. So what was my take home message here? That you can really make the point that computational tricks can be studied as regularization device in a kind of precise sense. And this kind of least squares linear setting becomes a good playground to understand ideas, okay? Uh, 
You have to sweat a lot to go beyond that, but I do believe that this uh, allows to make predictions that you can somewhat use to guide your practice, even if it's clearly much more simplified. The final solver we get, to the best of my knowledge, the faster solver for Gaussian processes and, uh, and kernel methods uh, available. And again, uh, the game now is wide because you can just go and uh, from a theoretical point of view or a critical point of view, either keep the simple setting and add more tricks, parallelization, dropout, you name it, okay? Or move on and try to use this idea to help building more complicated algorithm in complicated pipelines. I'm done.